it's interesting that Mary was looking forward to the coming of the Christ child. And she recognized that he was her savior. God does the foolish things to confound the wise, doesn't he? Yes, he does. Uh, there's a song, I think Virginia used to sing it years ago, and it said that, Mary, did you know that when you kissed your baby boy, you kissed the face of God? And that's really a profound statement. Uh, there's a song that says, Kiss the King. And so I, I want us to heighten our awareness because what we're expecting is exactly what we're going to get. And so if our expectancy has increased, then that is going to be a good thing. Um, the rest of that song in uh, Luke 1, 46 to 55, that scripture said that, and his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He has showed strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the, proud in the imagination of their heart. He has put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. So this song... This scripture applies to us. And all the scriptures in the Bible that speak of Jesus' birth speak to us. And let's not let it become a holiday that's just kind of trite and it's so busy and we forget what holiday should mean holy day. The holy day to celebrate the birth of Christ. And it's interesting that in the spirit of these people that were on earth at that time, there was a heightened expectancy of the coming of the Lord. Now, I think that that's going to happen in the end time when Jesus is about to come back. Too. I think in his people there's going to be a quickening of the Spirit of God in them, where we're going to be getting more and more excited, amen, because of what is to come. And how do you know what's to come? Well, you need to read your Bible to know what is to come. That's, that's an important thing, number one. So let's look at Luke 1, 67 through 79, because Zacharias uh, began this prophesying, it appears, when uh, the birth of John the Baptist was going to happen. Now, John the Baptist was a cousin of Jesus, and he was about six months older than Jesus was by the date. And it goes on to say, and his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied. Now, when you're filled with the Holy Ghost and you prophesy, then it's God speaking through you to people. Same with tongues and interpretation of tongues. That's God speaking through you to the church, to others. And you may prophesy to people that aren't even saved. But there is a move of the Holy Spirit in the people of God. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. Now, all the prophecies, Old Testament and New, all culminate in this birth of Jesus Christ, the looking for a savior. When we've been studying Wednesday night on faith and looking at, at Abram, looking at Enoch, looking at Adam, looking at the faith that began to grow in their lives. And the one thing that we're seeing is they were all prophets. They were all prophetic because they all saw 
Jesus coming in one way or another. And sometimes we don't quite understand that. And we don't pick it up when we're reading the scriptures. But the Lord was always speaking, 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 wasn't he? Except for 400 years. Then his silence was deafening between the book of Malachi and the birth of Christ. He didn't say a word. And so what we have recorded is important. It's important to know that the um, odds, the mathematical odds of all of the prophecies that are spoken of by Jesus Christ uh, have, and his birth have come to pass. Now that's an extraordinary odds. I think it's like I don't know, more zeros that you could put on a page. It's so many, like gazillions to one, that those would all come to pass when they were supposed to come to pass. And so we know that they've been speaking it. And what I say to you is, if we want to see Jesus return, we need to start talking about his return. Don't you think? I, I think about it. I think about that. Sometimes you're going to have what you say. The Bible says you're going to eat the fruit of your lips. So we need to be sure what we're saying is what we want to have for our next experience in life. Amen? So if we, we need to recognize that the prophets all wrote this as time went on, that they're all writing about this thing that's going to come to happen. And in verse 72, it says to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him with fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet to the way of peace. So God spoke. And as you recall, when God spoke to Zacharias, he went into doubt immediately. And so God silenced him for the whole time of the pregnancy. <laughs> if you can't say it, you're not going to get it. Amen. Some of us need to learn how to zip our lips and quit speaking our fears and the nastiness we have inside, ooh, that's hard to do, isn't it? And to begin to speak what it is we want. Because our behavior and our speech and our whole life will go in that direction. And so Zacharias, he spoke of John the Baptist, who was to come to make straight the way of the Lord. John was the prophet to come, and he spoke of Jesus. Jesus was born six months later, and he began to grow, and they both grew. It says that John grew in the wilderness, and it says that Jesus, he grew in the household there in Nazareth. And so it's, it's an interesting thing, and I think that we don't pay attention. I've said this before, but I think y'all need to pay attention a little bit more what the Bible's saying. Now, if we go back to Isaiah 7, verse 14, we see God speaking to a wicked king. All right, so we can see him talking to Zacharias. We can see him talking to through Mary. But those were Jewish people. They were of his, his group of people. But now he goes back to wicked king Ahaz. And he speaks to Ahaz through the prophet Isaiah. And this is one of the most amazing prophecies that I have, have seen because it's interesting he is really against Ahaz. King Ahaz was wicked. He was very evil. And in the midst of, of God speaking to him the truth of what he's doing and the recompense of what's going to come into his life, he says to him, Therefore, the son 
the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, I know that Ahaz had no idea what he was talking about. In the midst of the correction, he gave hope. In the midst of correction, he will always give us hope and give us direction. And thus he did. And this came to pass, did it not? A virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. Now, in Micah 5, 2 through 4, God gave the place of his birth through the prophet Micah. And it says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be the ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Therefore will he give them up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. And he shall stand and feed in strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the names of the Lord his God. And they shall abide, for now shall he be great unto the ends of the earth. Bethlehem of Freda, the city of bread. That's what that means. Bethlehem is the city of bread. The bread Jesus was the bread of life. It came down from heaven, the bread of God. And an interesting thing about Bethlehem is that Bethlehem was where they raised the sacrificial lamb. For Passover. And so these lambs were raised there. They were in the fields there. And, and Jesus was born there. He was the lamb without spot or blemish. And he was sent to what? Take away the sins of the world. More so than the other little lambs that were born that were to be sacrificed in the temple according to the Jewish law. And it's even thought, sometimes I've heard it said, that the very cave that Jesus was born in was one of the caves that they birthed the little lambs for, the, the Levites that were taking care of the, the shepherds that were taking care of the Levite shepherds that were taking care of birthing the lambs and raising them up and checking them, that they were also birthed in that cave. So he was birthed at the same place in the same cave, and what was a manger? It was a place where they fed them, and they also put the little newborn lambs in, and they wrapped their legs when they were born because they didn't want any harm to come to them. So they wrapped them all over so they couldn't be scarred, they couldn't be cut, they couldn't get roughed up in any way. And when they did that, then they laid them in those mangers. Now, Jesus was laid in a manger in swaddling clothes. He was wrapped up in rags. I mean, it was no uh, bassinet baby here. <laughs> but the whole point is he, he, he mirrored what had already been as a shadow and brought it into existence in his very birth. Now, John 1.14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. It's truly a holy time. Uh, Christmas, meaning Christ's Eve, the Eve of his birth, is a holy time. The Word was made flesh. It doesn't mean he became human beings like you and I. It means that he became flesh. He clothed himself in flesh, but he was still God. He was still God. Uh, Jesus was still that lamb who was come to give his life. And we get caught up in Christmas with the presents and all of the food and all of the things that are going on and the festivities and Many times, much of the world, they really don't understand uh, the Christian picture of Christmas. It just becomes more um, commercialized as time goes on. 
but it's important for us to recognize this God who was born in the flesh was born to die for us. It's always wonderful when a baby is born. But when the baby is born, we don't always think of an early death for the baby, do we? In fact, we don't ever think of the baby dying at all. Any baby. We don't want any baby to die. We want all babies to come to birth, don't we? We don't want them to die in the womb. We don't want them to be murdered and killed. It's my political statement for this day. But it is the thing that uh, Jesus came with the express purpose of dying for us, giving his life for us. And his birth was also announced by an angel and attended by an army of angels to mere shepherds, shepherds who raised lambs, shepherds who may have raised paschal lambs, the lambs for the Passover. And this it is a place that everyone saw the birth of this Savior because the angels told the shepherds who ran to see and they saw that he was birthed in the multitude. I have to laugh when we sing Silent Night. Do we think that the, the manger scene was silent? They were in the manger because there was no housing in the, in the inns because there were so many people that came to town to pay their taxes back to where they were supposed to come when, where they, the towns they were from, which is what brought Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem, the house of bread. And so then was, his birth was announced there, and uh, he was hidden in a multitude of people through all kinds of noise, Right? I mean, you know what it is to be in a stable? Well, you're sitting in one. <laughs> Say, what? This was a stable. This was an eight-horse stable. So <laughs> here we are. And that Jesus was born there. He made a mansion out of that stable by his very birth. And it couldn't be. Right. Just by his presence in the place. Luke 2, 10 through 14. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you this day, not next week, but this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign to you. You shall find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with an angel the multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth and goodwill towards men. That says something about the reason Jesus came, doesn't it? Peace on earth and goodwill from God towards men. Jesus was the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords was born in a manger where he was hidden from the enemy who sought to kill him. Now Simeon, he was looking for him too. In fact, Simeon had been looking for the birth of the Redeemer for a long, long time. In Luke 25, it says, Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. He was looking the consolation, the answer to the problem that Israel had. Now, when you think about this, I don't think that Simeon, this man, talked much else than he was waiting for the Savior. What are you doing going to church so much of the time? Well, I'm just waiting for the Savior. He's coming soon. Why do you always be here? Why do you always talk like this? Because I'm waiting for the Savior. If my words can help bring him, I'm helping him, right? I mean, basically, he talked about it. He lived it. He breathed it. He waited for him. He was there in the temple when they brought Jesus in. Isn't that amazing? 
you could say, well, that's just a coincidence. That's no coincidence. That is God's timing, which is perfect. And then also, there in the temple, there was another person waiting. Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. And she was of great age. She had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And now she was a widow of about four score and four years. So how old was she? She was a widow of four score and four years. So she had seven years, so she was 91, right? Could have been 90, probably 91. Yeah. And she served God with, prayer, with prayers and fasting night and day. So her widowhood to her was not a curse. Her widowhood was an opportunity to serve God. Her widowhood was an opportunity to pray and to fast and to await the birth that was spoken of in the Old Testament, in the scriptures that she knew. And she came in at that instant and gave thanks likely to the Lord. How did they know this baby was the baby they were waiting for? Holy Ghost, yeah, the Holy Ghost. They knew just like John the Baptist leapt for joy in Elizabeth's womb when Mary came to visit. Spirit recognized spirit. And that's a powerful thing in our lives as we become attuned to God. We begin to recognize God and the righteousness and the holiness of his presence. And we know the difference then between the evil and the good. Quite simple. And it says that she spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. All of these people were looking for him to come. All these people were looking for the king of kings and the Lord of lords. After his death on the cross, in Mark 15, 43, it says, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly to Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. So he could have been killed for going and asking for that body. However, he'd been waiting. He'd been waiting for the kingdom. If this was part of the kingdom, if this was part of the kingdom, he was part of it, wasn't he? In the waiting, we participate. You see, those that were looking for him found him. He was not hidden from them. He revealed himself. God revealed himself in Christ. Christ revealed himself to us through his birth epic, his death, and his resurrection. All of these things had never happened in that way, ever, ever in recorded time. And a great star announced his birth, a star in the heavens in the constellation of the lion. And that the one-time king was to be born, which is what made Herod so angry that there was another king coming and expected that was greater than he. He was the lion of the tribe of Judah. And the kings of the Orient then followed that great star and found him whom they were seeking. They were all seeking. They were seeking. How many seekers do we have? Or do we just have hangers on? Or do we just have observers? Do we just have, have um, spectators? Or do we have seekers? Are we seeking the kingdom of God? You know, he's called by many names throughout all the scriptures. These names reveal his person, his character, his position, his relationship to the Father, and his power, his majesty, and his authority. But somehow, in this hour, the church has lost all respect. A lot of the church has lost a lot of all the respect for God. 
in the one that they're seeking. They're not seeking them anymore. They want all psychological results and all kinds of different kinds of solutions for everything and that we can fix it ourselves. And believe me, if we'd been able to fix it ourselves, Jesus would have never had to go through what he went through. He is God, and we are not. We need to recognize that. Now, Peter, in Acts 2.36, proclaimed him as both Lord and Christ. He said, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. The one that you despise, the one that you put to death, the one that you threw away, the one that you didn't feel was worth anything, he made him your Lord and your Christos. He made him your Savior. Think on these things. A.W. Tozier, I'm going to quote him uh, in one of his devotionals, he said, no Christian believer should ever forget what the Bible says about the person and the offices of the eternal Son, the Christ of God. God hath made this same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Jesus means Savior. Lord means Sovereign. Christ means Anointed One. Jesus as Lord and Christ and Savior, never dividing his person or his offices. Remember the apostle Peter did not proclaim Jesus only as Savior. He preached to them also the declaration of Paul declared, if you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. Three times in the passage to the Romans, Christians, the Roman Christians, they were told how to be saved. Paul calls Jesus Lord. He says that faith in the Lord Jesus plus confession of that faith to the world brings salvation to us. That's what it takes. It doesn't take your grandma being saved. It doesn't take your sister, your brother. It means you must confess Christ as Lord because he brings salvation to us. We are saved. I don't know. I'm safe and saved. Amen? Are you safe and saved? We know that. And this King of Kings and this Lord of Lord has undertaken in each of our lives. So Christmas should be a great time of the year for miracles. It should be a great time of the year to get delivered from bad habits. It should be a great time of the year to let him be King of our lives, to be Lord of our lives, to be the Savior of mankind. How do we do that? Well, we can wish people Merry Christmas. We can tell it. We can go tell it, right? When we get a chance, we can tell it. Tell it. First Timothy 6, 14 through 16 says, To keep all his precepts unsullied and flawless, irreproachable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Anointed One. So Timothy was waiting for Jesus to return. He was waiting for him to return. He says, which appearing will be shown forth in his own proper time by the blessed, only sovereign ruler, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality in the sense of exemption from every kind of death and lives in unapproachable light, whom no man has ever seen or can see. Unto him be honor and everlasting power and dominion. Amen. So be it. A declaration. A declaration. He is coming. He is immortal. He is great. He's greater than anything that could touch your life. He is beyond our time frame. He is eternal. And to him be honor and power and dominion. Church, we need to act like that's what he deserves. We need to act like that is how we feel about him. That we honor him. That we're going to do our best for him. John the Revelator said in, in Revelation 19, 11 through 16, he saw him. He saw him. 
And he said, after that, I saw the heavens opened and a white horse appeared. And the one who was riding it is called faithful, trustworthy, loyal, incorruptible, steady, and true. And he passes judgment and wages war in righteousness, in holiness, justice, and uprightness. I want to live a holy life. I want to dwell in a place where justice is known to be of God and to be upright in all my dealings, don't you? We do need to do that. His eyes blaze like a flame of fire, and on his head are many kingly crowns or diadems. And he has a title, name, his name, his name inscribed, which he alone knows or can understand. He's dressed in a robe dyed by dipping in blood, and the title by which he is called is the Word of God. And the troops of heaven, clothed in fine linen, dazzling and clean, followed him on white horses. And from his mouth goes forth a sharp sword with which he can smite, afflict the nations. And he will shepherd and control them with a staff, a scepter, a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath and indignation of God, the all-ruler, the almighty, the omnipotent. Nobody is getting away with anything. Can I relieve you from that worry? Nobody is getting away with anything. Now, the only buddy that you need to take care of is your buddy. Are you walking in truth, righteousness, and justice? I mean, seriously. Nobody's getting away with anything. It says we'll have to give an account for every word that we speak when we see them. We better pray for crop failure. What do you think? Uh-huh, bad seeds. <laughs> but he's merciful and he's good. And it says, on his garment, his robe, and on his thigh, his name, his title inscribed, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is above all power and authority that's in this world. Today, he has shown himself to be above all power and authority since the institution of time. He has overcome in every area. And when the world was so corrupt that God was silent, when the church wasn't the church, but it was when the Jewish nation was so corrupt that nobody heard a word from God for 400 years. God was still working. God had a plan. God was having a baby, and he was getting ready. He was preparing, right? So I think Christmas is a good time for us to prepare our hearts again for the coming of Christ into our hearts. You say, well, does that mean I need to get saved all over again? No, if you're saved, you're saved. But sometimes you may have drifted. Sometimes you may have fallen away. Sometimes you forgot he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords, which means he has authority, power, and the say-so over everything that goes on in this world. The enemy has limited power, limited area. God knows everything from the beginning through to the end. He's eternal, he's immortal, he's indivisible. He's a great God. And if he's on your side, nothing, nothing can keep you from that blessed hope of his return. Amen? And I'm excited about it. The more I read this, the more I think about Christmas, every year I think we're getting closer. Every year we're getting closer. And every year we should be getting better. We should be able to control ourselves better. We should be able to kick the devil out and get rid of all of those things that are binding us, all the chains that are holding us, whatever it may be, addictions or... Um, uh, unholy alliances or changing things that, that we know don't please God, we ought to just clean it up. I mean, serious, every year we should look at it and change what's going on in our lives that we can draw closer to him. Those who were waiting for him, looking for him, seeking him, they found him. 
they found him. So that's a great, he will be found. If you feel far away from God, he's seeking you. He will be found of you as, as you seek him. He will come together as you turn away from wickedness and you move into holiness and the knowledge that he is king of all kings and lord of all lords. Is there anyone this morning that would like to rededicate their life to the Lord to just repent of your sins before he comes and and actually, um, I'm not saying nobody's without sin because we're still in a human flesh, but we can keep things cleaned up, can't we? Isn't that why we clean our houses? We keep the dust out. We try and keep the things from, from you know, stacking up and that sort of stuff. Well, things can stack up in our life, things that don't glorify God, things that don't uh, speak of his power and his majesty. And so uh, we can all talk about testimonies, but there's a lot of testing and moaning before you get to the testimony. And so if we're going to make it fast, let's make it fast. In Sunday school, we're talking this morning, it took 40 years for Israel to make a journey of 11 walking days coming out of Egypt. 40 years. But it does it have to take that long? I don't know about another 40 years. I, don't, I got some invested in this, right? So 73, I'm over 40 years now in seeking him. I, I can't say I've arrived, but things are sure a lot better than they used to be because Jesus is Lord and he is King of Kings and he is Lord of Lords and that gives me peace. And I'm not ashamed to see him. And I think we all need to recognize let's just Repent of the things that we may be feeling guilty about and put it away, right? In the name of Jesus. And we're going to agree with God's word that all things are made new again and this will not happen anymore. Amen? Amen. So, Father, let's all pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, I repent of my shortcomings where I have fallen short of your glory, where I've spoken the wrong words, where I am in bondage to something other than you. Because you came to set me free, nothing can hold me. Nothing can hold me unless I allow it. And God, I thank you that you set me free. And I will not return to Egypt anymore. I am done with it. <laughs> I'm done with it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.